so I'm in Singapore in the beginning of July and it's election time and if you see why I don't like posters they're everywhere you've got that that lightning bolt is the sign of the PAP uh, this one over here is the com competing party um, they've got what looks like a frond an island frond um, but this whole idea of elections in the modern day, all of it's a bit antiquated for many, many reasons. Um, let me see if I can try to try to count the ways. So what, one of the biggest problems overall with politics in general is that quite frankly, you know, if you can make the buses run the, and the trains run, uh, and give people enough housing, for the most part, you stay in power. And that is in fact, uh, what is behind the PAP, the ruling party, um, the, the longevity within this country in Singapore. So it turns out, however, that that's not all what, what people want when they end up having the housing and having the transportation and having the trains. So, and, and why is that? And the reason for that is actually uh, not as simple as you might think. One of the politicians here has advanced a metaphor called the moving escalator. And what he's trying to say is that it doesn't necessarily matter where you are in relation to other people within your country. But what matters more is that you feel as if that the escalator is moving up. So if you simply stay still, you've got a problem and you end up having a loss of societal cohesion. And that's a pretty apt metaphor because once you have the housing and you have the healthcare system and you have the transportation system, it becomes very diff difficult for governments to continue to maintain the attention of their own citizens. And part of that is because they've been too successful. And that is actually one of the issues the PAP is facing right now, is that it's just been too damn successful. And that's the curse of Singapore. You can see that there's practically, there's practically no crime. Uh, here, the police department is perhaps the most honest in the entire world. That's not a coincidence. The police are a reflection of the country, well, in this case, it's a city-state, so of the city that they're representing. And one of the problems in America, of course, is that you have these national unions that have corrupted um, because of their asso association with uh, an unlimited budget um, on the national military level. Uh, they've managed to trickle down that, that corruption into a local level. And in fact, that's what the United States, the economy of the United States is based on. It's based on this idea of a trickle down economy that George H.W. Bush talked about, the senior uh, president. And when he was in, in a debate, he was explaining the US economy and he was saying it's a trickle down economy. And people still don't understand that. And they don't understand what that means. What that means is that in the US, they're going to use an unaudited, essentially an unlimited budget, sometimes a black box budget as well, in order to establish a market leading position. And once they establish that market leading position, uh, they're going to export it. And so that company might be in debt. Oh, here's something else, look. You can apply for a permit and get a, and then just walk around with a bullhorn advertising your candidate. I hope you can hear what he's saying because I, I can't. Um, but when that happened to me, I, I had to actually, was in one of these buildings and kind of ran out trying to figure out what was going on because I'm not used to it. There are some cities in, Amer in America that have this kind of a system that allow this kind of, what I consider noise pollution. Um, more, and, and, and like specifically Camden, New Jersey comes to mind uh, when Cory Booker, who's a good politician, uh, was trying to win his first election there way back. 
Uh, so I don't like these things. I think they give the appearance of, I mean, they give the appearance of competition. Because the fact of the matter is that the PAP is going to win this election, it's going to win a majority. And the only question is going to be how many opposition candidates are going to succeed. Is it going to be you know, 12 or 20 out of the 100 or so? And part of that is, is similar to you know, the United States where you have gerrymandering, where you have essentially one party, the Republicans, uh, because of this trickle-down economy that comes from an unaccountable source of revenue. And because of that unaccountable source of revenue that trickles down through innovation, from everything from your cell phone, right, which, which uses GPS um, if you're in the US, or G GNSS if you're in Europe and so on, all the way down to your clothing, your dry fit clothing, is probably something that they came up with uh, if, if somebody was stationed out in the Middle East. They probably, you know, essentially experimented on uh, military people overseas and then came up with something that worked. Now, in the old days, this wasn't necessarily a bad system. I'm using um, a cup. My favorite cup here is, is for coffee and tea is stainless steel. It's shaped exactly as the old World War II um, mugs, the standard, standard issue that the soldiers would use because it's, it's basically indestructible. It's supposed to last for a long time. And for a long time, that's what the military stood for. Uh, things that lasted for a long time uh, that were reliable. And uh, things went awry in Vietnam because if you have all this debt and you're competing, you know, ultimately, if you, if you don't get ultimately, if you don't get to pick your winners and sh winners and losers, you end up with a lot of people and a lot of debt. You don't get to make your money back when you export to other countries, and that creates a lot of problems. So, the question now is, you know, what what, what does all this mean for all of us? Um, of course, no matter who you are, this is the son of the founder, this is Prime Minister Lee. He is just one of the sons of the founder of Singapore, uh, LKY, Lee Kuan Yew. And uh, of course in Asia, the, the last name is, is written as the first name, uh, simply because Asian alphabets and Middle Eastern alphabets go from right to left. And so here, uh, the Prime Minister, the original founder of the country, LKY, had three children. Uh, his, his, one of his sons uh, is now Prime Minister for the PAP. Uh, I actually like the daughter the most. She became a doctor uh, and has written quite a few articles for The Straits Times and also a book. Uh, I believe it's called A Hakka Woman's Journey. Hakka referring to the different ethnic groups within China um, that, uh, in, in, in particular, depending on the province you're in, right? You've got, you know, Canton and so on. So the real question is, politics, right? You have a, a, a quasi-gerrymandering system here that guarantees that the PAP wins. And in this case, the PAP should win. They're doing a good job. Um, but you can see how within the United States, ensuring that essentially the same party, whichever party does not interrupt this trickle-down economy, whichever party does not question military purchases, uh, whichever, you know, uh, party does not attempt to change the status quo, um, that's the party that's, that's going to stay. And that's the party that's going to do whatever it takes to stay in power. Now, this is why Bernie Sanders can't win. This is why Ron Paul can't win. They literally cannot win, um, no matter what happens. And so the question is, people are becoming, they're realizing all this, and they're becoming dissatisfied because they've been told growing up that they had choices. And they didn't realize until they got older that the substance doesn't matter if you rig the procedures, whether it's gerrymandering or, I don't know how the PAP does it in this country. I'm not, I'm not astute enough to figure that out. Um, but, you know, you've got a situation where, is it gerrymandering? I, I really don't know. Uh, you know, is it simply, you know, the, the, the preservation of credibility over a long period of time? I, I don't know. But the history of this place is volatile. Singapore itself existed because it was kicked out of Malaysia. The, uh, the, the founder of the country originally wanted to be part of Malaysia, which is the northern neighbor. And it wasn't able to do that. And so what it did was when the British left, 
Um, and in fact, Singapore wanted them to stay because they were a source of protection from overseas and the British Empire in the 1960s was falling apart. So it just couldn't afford to maintain its empire. And so we have a situation where, you know, even though Singapore wanted to stay, it, it ended up having to leave. And so you had what's called a two-state solution. You had the Muslims going into Malaysia and creating a majority with the Malay population, which then had to contend with a lot of outside workers that the PAP, sorry, <laughs> that the British brought in, uh, namely the Indians and the Chinese. And then Singapore ended up becoming, as part of this two-state solution, majority Chinese. And as you can see, all the politicians on all the posters we've seen have been Chinese in this district. That's not true everywhere. There are Malays here, but you know, the fact of the matter is that as the Prime Minister Mahathir complains about up north, the fact of the matter is that the Malays in Singapore uh, do not enjoy the same kind of status and visibility and influence as they do in majority Malay Malaysia. And so this becomes another issue. You have stability because you have separated uh, ethnic groups and religious groups. And the question, here we go, there's a Malay. Uh, looks like an islander there, and obviously somebody who's mixed. Uh, so this is not the ruling party. This is the, uh, I don't know, actually, I'm not sure. One of them looks mixed. Um, so China is huge. So just because somebody has dark skin doesn't mean that they're necessarily Malay or mixed. Um, so one of the issues over time has been that you have a, a large population that's been separated and on the basis of that separation, which in the past was not only ethnic, but based on whether or not you wanted to align yourselves with communist China, communist Soviet Union, and therefore that economic system or the opposition. And you have all these separations that today make no sense. And they don't make any sense because people are tired of being separated. And they certainly don't like a situation where, you know, you have a, a, the, the idea that you know, where you're born has so much emphasis and influence on the, on the end result. What language you speak has so much influence on your education and your earning power simply because of the currency in your country uh, within a global system that is run by, at this point, technocrats. Uh, whoever can, can maintain the security of those online transfer systems. And I don't want to sort of I don't want to underemphasize how difficult it is to maintain an, an international banking system. JP Morgan spends nine billion, with a B, dollars a year on technology. Just, you know, that data centers, mobile, digital, of course, security. Nine billion dollars a year. When people studied economics, they were never taught that technology necessarily leads within this economic system, within this trickle-down system, to uh, either a direct or indirect, um, not collusion, um, but melding, of melting or melding of the state and the private sector. Because who else can afford, except for a few people, uh, except for a few countries, and except for a few entities, who else can afford to spend $9 billion a year? And if you can't, within that global network, you're unable to spend that kind of money, you end up being cast by the wayside. That's what happened, even if you've got a better idea, that's what happened to MySpace, precursor to Facebook. Um, that's what happened to anybody that didn't latch, to latch itself on to the prevailing uh, primary leader. And this has consequences. Facebook was funded by uh, what's called NQTEL, which is the venture capital arm of the United States, of one of the agencies within the United States, in order to advance facial recognition technology. So you can see how all these things together, at some point when you study it, it begins to look like we have the illusion of choice rather than any sort of substance. And people in Asia are starting to understand that as well. And that is having consequences even for governments that have succeeded beyond their wildest dreams. Uh, when Singapore separated from Malaysia, it didn't have access, well, it says it did not have access to water. It did. It just had to buy it through a, a treaty that the British negotiated with Malaysia. So it didn't have water in the country, but it had access to it through the law, through international law. Um, sorry, 
We go here in Africa, you see the cars over here, all, all of them are new because the government mandates that you can't have them with cars. Um, if you have a car that's more than 10 years old, uh, you actually have to turn it in uh, and buy a new one. And these cars are not cheap. If you have a car uh, in Singapore, you're fairly well off. And that's one of the reasons the traffic is not so bad and why people use the buses as well. Um, so the question is, now that people understand that they have the illusion of choice through all these sorts of procedural mechanisms, like gerrymandering, and through the very economic system that they were told gave them choices, when in fact it was just a trickle-down economy that came from a military victory in World War II, or depending on what side you were on. So you, well, what happens now? And what's happening now is because people are unable to understand their own history, what's happening now is division. Here we go. Uh, this gentleman over here, Abdul Rahim, uh, is a Malay and he is with the PAP. Um, and so people are also, if, all, if they are minorities, becoming upset at this dependence on the visual in advertising and television and so on, which, which has been happening for a long time. Because if you think about it, that gentleman is probably a token minority. He doesn't really have any actual power. Now, Singapore, of course, would deny that. Uh, and in fact, it, it is surrounded by Malays. Uh, Indonesia is sort of Malay, with different names, but uh, their language is similar, but not the same. But the fact of the matter is, oops, I've been covering the camera. Um, let me try to go a different way. So the fact of the matter is that, you know, what's happening is this idea of diversity um, has not worked out because people are, are, especially minorities, are realizing they don't have any actual power. They're being used in order to make the ruling party, make the status quo, look tolerant. So this is a, another issue that these countries have. And again, it, it must be stated that Singapore um, had racial riots a while ago, um, but took action to make sure that social cohesion would be the number one, if not, you know, the top five at least, um, just the number one philosophy going forward. And in order, to, in order to accomplish that, you can see how speech would have to be restricted. You can't have people going online and mocking a minority. Um, you know, if, if in fact you're interested in social harmony, first of all, because you don't know where those those comments are coming from, you can be spoofed, S-P-O-O-F, um, or simply, you know, there's going to be some action taken uh, that will make you look like a police state. Uh, if you start going online and trying to, you know, capture everybody and warn them and so on, who makes comments that are against the minority within your country. So the, the technological advancements that we've seen have allowed you know, ruling parties to bypass those kinds of heavy-handed measures and simply use what's what, we've, what Westerners would consider censorship, but Easterners would consider common sense in order to maintain social, social harmony and provide, again, what is in this country, the most honest police force uh, in the entire world, um, which is not, not even something Hong Kong can boast, or Malaysia for that matter. So even though, so this is, this is the irony of the whole thing, even though there is some truth to the idea that these sorts of advertisements, this is not a political advertisement, this has been there for quite some time. And you know, they really make an effort, right? You've got Chinese, Sri Lanka, Indian, Malay, and they've, and they've included everybody. And some people, especially in the West, might look at that and be cynical. I'm not, not in this country. In this country, you cannot be cynical because uh, the, once again, because of, because of the racial riots, the country and the founder uh, really did go out of their way to create a society that would be tolerant. Uh, partly because they had to. Uh, they were a small country in the middle of, you know, occupied by the British and the Japanese. Uh, they really had to sort of forge their own way. And part of that, of course, means that they had to create a system that worked for everybody. Um, and so when you, when, you, when you are sincere with respect to inclusion, things tend to work. Now, I don't want to be too slavish to the idea that everything is hunky-dory, 
because in fact, the, if you go on the government's website, the, the government's website says that we plan on maintaining the racial proportions within this country. In other words, as best as we can, as best as we can, we want to maintain this idea of about 70% Chinese, 20% Malay, and 10% other in terms of citizens, you know, mix, mix, Indian, and so on. Uh, that does not include all the immigrants. This country is about 20% immigrants, which is astounding for a city of its size. And whenever you have, when you don't have that much land, you have to, they have to build up. Same thing happening in Hong Kong. So the question is, what's happening now that people are no longer able to uh, promote censorship because of technology? It's become, because it's becoming increasingly harder to make it within a society that has to spend $9 billion a year on technology just in order to have a functioning system, a payment system. So a lot of the answers here depend on whether you understand the history. If you understand the history, there's no way that you could not have respect for what this country has accomplished. Um, the question though is, how do we create a society where everyone, despite having, them, having their lives engineered for success, how do you create a society where people still feel as if they have control and what we would call self-actualization and self-determination? And this is where I think the primary, primary philosophical issue comes up. And like I said, this, I don't know if you're familiar with HGB flats, the reform of public housing. The core of Singaporean citizenship is that everyone is going to own a home and we're going to help you own a home. And one of these flats will, I mean, the government helps you, so you're paying about a, one, about a 2% interest rate, um, if not lower, depending on the contributions of your employer. And these are set up to cater to everyone, families, young people, and so on. And there's also a, an ethnic mandate to make sure that you don't have what LKY called racial ethnic, sorry, ethnic enclaves. So everyone is going to have, all of these will reflect the uh, citizenship pool. You're gonna have Indians, uh, you're gonna have Malays, we're gonna have everybody here based on the proportions so that you don't have these enclaves. Now, to give you an idea of why credibility matters so much, you know, you can look at that mandate and say, well, that's they're doing that because they want to minimize political power. If you spread out all the minorities, they don't end up having any sort of primary influence uh, anywhere in the whole city state uh, in terms of electing a politician that speaks for them. And that relies on a bit of a cynical assumption that, you know, race and political beliefs overlap. And sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But the reason credibility matters is because if you look at it that way, you're obviously going to have a different opinion of the country than if you really understand the history. If you understand that there, there used to be racial riots, if you understand that the country was kicked out uh, of Malaysia and therefore had to ensure good relationships with its neighbors, being literally across the way uh, from Ind Indonesia as well. So if you don't understand the history, you end up having a very cynical viewpoint. So the question is, to me, it's always been education. And look, look what we're passing over here. We're passing our school. The way the city planning works is that, you know, there's always going to be a school nearby within, hopefully within walking distance. And because it's so safe, you can, I haven't seen, like in Japan, you'll see kids walking to school by themselves, but not, not necessarily here because you have a bus. So, you know, people just use the bus. Um, so all these are philosophical questions. You know, countries that have managed to do a good job uh, in engineering safety and housing, all the, all the essentials, now are faced with a greater and more difficult problem, uh, which should have been solved by education. But there's a problem with that because if you, well, for example, one of the things Singapore you know, keeps talking about is, you know, we, we were cast out all alone in the whole world. The British were leaving us. We didn't want them here anyway. We didn't have any water and so on. Well, again, the reality is they had water. It was negotiated for them by the British under what is now perhaps an unfair arrangement with Malaysia in terms of the, the pricing. Um, and Singapore has taken steps to ameliorate and sort of make, try to make a better, uh, a more fair system post-contract. Uh, I believe it's a 99 year lease that was set up for us, a 99 year supply uh, that was set up you know, in, in the partition. 
Um, but, and then Singapore has offered to build infrastructure that helps, you know, maintain the water supply and so on. But the fact of the matter is, you know, every country does this, right? They all say, we didn't have anything and now we're successful. Um, for example, I just found out that one of the reasons the Israelis won the six day or seven day war was based on a preemptive strike. Um, based on what I saw, they ended up bombing and taking out the entire Arab League's air force that was just grounded in a similar attack to Pearl Harbor. And so once you take out somebody's entire air force, uh, you know, especially in the 1960s, uh, you know, victory is probably assured. But, you know, if you say that, you look, you don't look as good as sort of some alter alternative history where you, know, you were this small country uh, trying, trying to fight for independence that took on these mighty powers, multiple powers and won. And so there's also this realization that the history that has been taught has been taught out of context. And as a result, people are now able to, um, I guess, people are now able to be susceptible. You know, sort of like a virus. So because, because the initial history that they've been taught has, has been taught out of context, you know, that lack of context has created holes for viruses to come in, uh, whether domestically or foreign, and upset the body politic. And that's what these countries are now faced with. And if what they do, like the United States has been having these issues for a long time, what the U.S. has done is they've used minorities as props. Um, you know, they put them on billboards, they've elected, they've managed to have a few elections here and there. Uh, you know, for example, um, in Brooklyn, or nearby Brooklyn area in New York, uh, one of the most outspoken uh, representatives is Ocasio-Cortez. The problem is that she's only, you know, she gets a lot of airtime, but she's only, I think in the last election, she managed to win her, she won her district with about, I'm not 100% sure about this, but it's about 25,000 votes. So this person that's won about 20, that got a seat at the, at the media, uh, you know, parade, based on 25,000 votes, not even 1% of the, of the U.S. population. So you can see how the United States has, has used politics as almost a distraction game to make it look like there's been progress. And if you do it that way, the consequences are obvious, as we can see today with the protests with George Floyd, uh, which should not be surprising after what happened to Rodney King in the 1990s. So once again, when you come to a place like Singapore, well, you can't, you just can't, because of, the, because of the size, make these sorts of superficial adjustments and expect to thrive, much less survive. You gain a better appreciation for just even the little things. Um, for example, this right here, if you have a card and you're a senior citizen, you can just tap your card and then you'll get a longer crossing time. So these things matter. They show that the country is focused on, on practical things as opposed to superficial visual things and the question really becomes at this point what do we do now to maintain if you're in singapore what do you do now that the game has changed that you've succeeded and now because of you've, you've been successful you know how do you move away and try to foster things like creativity things like a wholesome historical education even if the facts that come out may not necessarily be conducive to marketing your products worldwide uh, if you're in the United States, how do you learn from a country like Singapore when your system is set up to be completely different? You know, in other words, instead of having one layer of government, uh, because, of, because of the small size, you've got multiple, you've got at least three or four. So these are all things that government has to figure out. And if it doesn't figure it out, it's quite possible that we're going to end up in a situation where the banks and the technology companies determine our way of life.